bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Aren't you glad to know this morning, Central, that there is nobody greater than the God we serve and worship? I want to re-emphasize an announcement that you heard during our announcement time. Next month is Dress Down Month, and by Dress Down, I do mean that next week you will see me up here in shorts and a polo. <laughs> Having me preach in a suit and tie every Sunday during the summer is cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> If you have your copy of God's Word with you this morning, I invite you to turn in there with me to the 139th number of the psalm, to Psalm 139. In your own personal time, in your own personal devotional time, I invite you to read Psalm 139 in its entirety. It's just 24 short verses, but for the purpose of our discussion this morning, we'll be reading and reviewing together verses 13 through verse 18. Verses 13 through verse 18, the second major section of Psalm 139. It's a psalm that invites us to celebrate how God made us. And however you are made, however you look, however your hair is, uh, whatever shape you are, Psalm 139 reminds us that, that God made us unique and beautiful. Hear the word of the Lord for you this morning, Central. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. The word of God for the people of God, will you pray with me? God, thank you that you are involved in every phase of our lives from creation until our eternity, Father God. And now as we seek to discover this truth afresh, as we seek to learn what you have for us through your word, we pray that your spirit would work in this, your house, Lord God, to teach us great and incredible truths contained in your word. And as always, our prayer is this, Father God, that as your word is explained, you would be exalted. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all who are God's people said. Amen. Allow me to put a tag on this text. Mirror, mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest? of them all. Some of you may be more familiar with this one, mirror, mirror, in my hand. Who's the fairest in the land? This is the question that every day the wicked queen asked her enchanted magical mirror in the classic iconic fairy tale, Snow White. The magic mirror was in part omniscient. It could see near and far throughout the land, and it could discern beauty, which made the magic mirror the perfect companion to the vain, evil queen of the land. She was obsessed with her own beauty and wanted to be considered the most beautiful person in the world. They shared a, a wonderful partnership because the mirror could discern beauty 
and the mirror was obligated to always tell the truth. And so long as the mirror revealed that it was the evil queen who was the most beautiful in the land, everything went fine. That is, until one day. The queen, the evil queen, asked the mirror the familiar question. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And for the first time, she heard the mirror reveal an opinion that was not her. Instead of saying that the queen was the most beautiful, the most fair thing in the land, the mirror revealed that it was actually the evil queen's stepdaughter, Snow White, who had surpassed the queen in beauty. This enraged the queen and sent her into a murderous, Tirade. She wanted to kill Snow White so she could again be pronounced as the most beautiful person in the land that she ruled over. She, she first tried to kill Snow White through hiring a huntsman who, who she said she would give a great reward to if he executed Snow White and brought as proof back of the murder the, her lungs and her heart. The huntsman took pity on Snow White and and allowed her to escape. And instead, he brought the queen the, the vital organs of a wild boar. The queen discovered that she was deceived when she woke up the next day and asked the mirror the familiar question, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And to her shock, rather than saying that she was, the mirror answered that it was Snow White revealing to the evil queen that Snow White was, was still alive. Unable to find a partner in her attempts to murder Snow White, she, she decided to do it herself. First through the use of the black arts and, and then through magic, and, and both attempts failed. In the Brothers Grimm version of that classic story tale, when the wicked queen goes to the wedding of Snow White, she glances at her beauty, and falls dead because of envy. The mistake that the evil queen made, and the mistake that you and I sometimes make, is that we look for validation and affirmation outside of ourselves and outside of the word of God. For the wicked queen, her affirmation came from that enchanted mirror, and, and for us, Sometimes you and I are, are guilty of looking for affirmation and, and validation of our own self-worth in culture. And any time we try to find affirmation and validation of our self-worth outside of God's word and outside of ourselves, we are bound to be disappointed. We are bound to look at ourselves as being insignificant and we are bound to envy the others around us. If that describes you this morning, then there is good news for you in Psalm 139. You don't have to go outside of yourself and outside of the Word of God to validate yourself, who you are, and how you look, because the Word of God can validate you and confirm your identity all by itself. When you word, read the Word of God, you discover that God has painstakingly and carefully created you, so much so that God can say about you that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, whether you're black or white, whether you're tall or short, whether you're curvaceous or slim, whether your hair is curly, straight, or natural, is a psalm for feeling good about yourself. It is characterized and classified as a psalm of praise. When we encounter these types of psalms, these psalms of thanksgiving or praise, they are generally written by a psalmist who is praising God because God has delivered them from some calamity 
because God has delivered them from the hands of their enemy or from tra some tragedy or from some sickness. But in Psalm 139, we find the psalmist praising God for God's goodness revealed in the creation of the psalmist. Initially, as we read through the first part of Psalm 139, we, we would find it hard to believe that this is really a psalm of praise. It, it reads more like a, a psalm of fear. In the first half of Psalm 139, the psalmist highlights two attributes of God, God's omniscience and God's omnipresence. God's omniscience means that nothing is hidden from him. He knows all, and God's omnipresent means that anywhere there is, God can affect and impact the situation. For the psalmist, this means that God knows everything about him and that, that there was nowhere that he could hide from God, that there was no secret with God, and that God saw everything that the psalmist did. Even if you say you don't have anything to hide, you really do have something to hide. And we all live in some type of fear, fear that someone would really know who we are. Now the psalmist believes, and he writes that God knows exactly who he is, and there is no hiding from God, that, that God knows exactly how impure our hearts and our thoughts are, that, that God knows your selfish attitude and your perverted ways. God knows that I put up a front for everyone else to see. God knows the depths of me and of you, that God has complete knowledge of all of us. In the first part of the psalm, the psalmist confesses that, Lord, you know me, and any attempt to keep secrets from God will not work because in Psalm 139, verse 8, the psalmist writes, where can I flee from your presence? God knows everything about you. He has read the secrets in your diary, the secrets that you don't want anybody else to know, the secrets that you hope will be kept hidden. How does that make you feel? For the psalmist, rather than inspiring fear, that inspires praise. Because even though God knows everything about him, God still loves him anyway. The psalmist doesn't have to put up a facade so that God can love him. God just loves him. I read recently a report that said that over 50 million people subscribe to some type of online dating service. Match.com, eHarmony, Black People Meet, Christians Meet.com. Don't act like y'all don't know them. And of those 50 million people, 90% of the profiles have some lie in them. 90% of the profiles tell some lie. Sometimes the lie is about physical appearance. There, I'm six foot five, when you really you're five foot six. Sometimes the, the lie is about how much money you make. That I'm a CEO of some major company when, when you really work at, at McDonald's. But all these lies have one thing in common. They reveal that there is a deep fear on the parts of some people that if someone truly knew who they were, they would be unlovable. That if you truly knew that I wasn't six foot five, that I didn't make six figures, if, if you truly knew that, that I was five foot six and, and I worked at McDonald's, you wouldn't be interested in me. We all have that fear that if someone truly knew the depths of our character, that we would not be loved. You may have that fear of, with other people, 
But the Psalm 139 gives us the assurance that you don't have to have that fear with God. God knows everything about you and loves you anyway. If, if this is a Psalm of David as the superscription attests, this means that, that God knew that David was a liar and a murderer. He knew that David was a deceiver and a cheat, but yet God still called David a man after his own heart Anyway, God knows who you are completely, but yet loves you unconditionally. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, writes this. There is tremendous relief in knowing that God's love for me is utterly realistic, based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about me so that no discovery can now disillusion him about me in the way I am often disillusioned about myself and quench his determination to bless me. He sees all the twisted things about me that my fellow men do not see and that he sees more corruption in me than th that which I see in myself. There is, however, equally great incentive to worship and love God in the thought that, for some unfathomable reason, he wants me as his friend and he desires to be my friend. And he has given his son to die for me. God knows you completely, yet loves you unconditionally. God knows everything about the psalmist, and this is really a reason for the psalmist to celebrate. It is the second, it's in the second part of Psalm 139, do we see and understand why and how God can know so much about the psalmist, how, why and how God can know so much about us. Because at every point in our lives, at every point of development in our lives from birth until eternity, God is with us. God was forming and shaping us at birth, and God is with us till the very end. The second part of Psalm 139 invites us to celebrate the God who created us and celebrate how God created us. Psalm 139 verses 13 through 18 invites us to celebrate, to praise God for the fact that he created us the fact that he created us. Verse 13 makes this incredible claim about the nature and origins of human life, not just the psalmist's life, but of our lives as well. The psalmist writes in verse 13, you created me, referring to God, and you knit me together in my inmost wounds. To, to create means to generate, to, to produce. And to knit together means to, to give shape or to weave. The two words are, are near synonyms, but they are slightly nuanced. To create has to do with our origins. How did we get here? And to knit together has to do with the finished product, what you become, how you look, and who you are. Both seem to indicate that at every step of our development, God was personally and intimately involved in your creation. Those of us who would scientifically, who are scientifically inclined would, would scratch our heads and, and say how. We would dispute this claim or at the very least be confused by this claim because those of us who are, who are smart enough to know, know that we were created by our parents. We were created by the sexual act of our parents and, and how we look and who we are for all intents and purposes were determined by the genes that our parents gave us. And David, is, as an ancient man, is ignorant of these scientific claims. It's not that, that David is ignorant or that people in the ancient world didn't know how procreation worked. It, it's, it's David is saying something. He's saying that there is a hand that supersedes your development that is greater than your parents. He's saying that there's something responsible 
for how and who you are that is greater than your genes. There is something behind your parents and something behind your genetic makeup that makes up who you are, and that something is God. God chose your parents to aid you, him, in his development of you, and God chose to give you the genes that you have, but in every way, in every step, God created you. Here's what David is saying, that you are the intentional creation of a sovereign God who designed you to his precise specifications. He is the one that determined that you would come into this world. It is God the one who determined how you would look. It is God is the one who determined how you would be. God is responsible for your creation and for your development. And, and there, there's a very real and serious implication that emerges out of this. If God is the one behind you being here this morning, if, if God is the one behind how you look and who you are, because God doesn't make mistakes, the fact that you're alive, the fact that you're here, the fact that you have your personality and the fact that, that you look the way you do is not a mistake. There is an intentional sovereign hand guiding your creation and guiding who you are. Ron Archer is the CEO of Dunamis Institute International, a, a major leadership and development firm located in South Florida. His success is by no means a mistake. He worked hard to be where he's at. But, but before Ron Archer ever became successful, people thought his very life was a mistake. As a 16-year-old girl, his mother prostituted herself and, and Ron was the result of that affair. Therefore, he thought that his very creation was a mistake. He was born 16 weeks premature, another mistake. Ron was born with a mental handicap, another mistake on top of two more, the two previous mistakes. And, and as an adolescent, he developed a severe stuttering problem, another mistake. And what do people do with mistakes? You abuse them. Throughout his whole life, Ron says that he was molested by people who, who were supposed to care for him and who were supposed to love him. So at 10 years old, believing that he was a mistake, Ron tried to commit suicide. He held a gun to his head, but the gun did not go off. Another mistake. Several years after that failed suicide attempt, he he ran into a teacher who handed him a Bible. And as he began to read through the Bible, he realized that, that God was behind the fact that he, he came into this world. God was the one who, who shaped who he was and how he was. And, and, and God was sovereignly directing the course of his life. And for the first time in Ron's life, he realized that he was not a mistake. The sovereign God of creation has intentionally designed you. Never believe that you are here by chance or you are here by mistake. God wants you to be here. Praise God for the fact that he intentionally created you. And he designed you to meet his specifications. Psalm 139 invites us to celebrate the fact that God created us. And Psalm 139 also invites us to praise God for how he created us. After declaring that God was behind his origins, Psalmist makes a, another incredible claim in verses 14 and 15. He says that God was also responsible for the manner in which he was created. There are two words in, in verse 14 that I'd like to highlight that describes the how 
of his creation. He says that God made him fearfully. The word fearfully speaks of, of reverence, how God put care into for, forming us. God didn't just put us together in the last minute. There was no assembly line in heaven manufacturing people just to get them out on the showroom floor as quickly as possible. Rather, each person God carefully put together. You were made with honor. Even the parts of you that you don't like, God carefully assembled and reverentially put together, let me say it again, you were made with honor. Johannes Vermeer is a Dutch Baroque painter who, who lived three and a half centuries ago. History remembers him as being one of the greatest artists of all time in spite of the fact that there are only 34 works attributed to Vermeer. He was not a prolific painter by, by anyone's imagination. He, even someone like Velasquez, who said, didn't paint a lot. We have over 100 of his works. Vermeer only left behind 34 artist, artistic paintings. That's because pe people say about Vermeer that, that he took his time to create works of complete art. One story tells about a time that Vermeer hired a model to, to pose for him and he had her stand in one place for eight hours. And after eight hours of just staring at her, he grabbed his brush, painted one stroke, and told her to come back same place, same time tomorrow. There was great detail in how Vermeer worked. And there is great detail in how God constructed you. God reverentially carefully puts you together and every detail of who you are and how you look is by intentional design. God looks at you and he sees the care and precision that it took to make you. But not only does the psalm say that you're fearfully made, he also says that you are wonderfully made. To be wonderfully made speaks about our uniqueness. The word wonderful describes a, a miracle. And in every sense of the word, you are a miracle. Scientists say that there have been over 115 billion people who have walked the earth. 115 billion people who have walked the earth. There are over 7 billion people who live on this earth right now. And of those 115 billion people who have ever walked the earth, there is no one like you. You are absolutely unique. God carefully constructed every detail about you. And then on top of that, he wanted you to be so wonderful, he gave you things about you that no one else has. God doesn't suspend a line and reintroduce it every hundred years. When he shaped you, he wasn't looking for, for a way not to be creative, so he thought, I'm going to make you look like somebody who lived 200, 300, 400 years ago, but rather every inch of you is unique. That's why God calls you wonderful, because there's no one else like you that has ever been, and there will be no one like you that will ever be. And rather than denigrating your unique features, rather than denigrating the, the parts about you that make you different, the psalmist says you should celebrate the parts about you that no one else has, because the parts about you that make you unique and different are actually God putting his stamp of wonderful on you. Verse 15, the psalmist goes a step further. He says that we were woven together in the depths. If, if this sounds familiar, it's because it should. I believe 
In that part of the psalm, the psalmist is intentionally echoing the creation story of Genesis 1 and 2, where God made man in his own image, where, where God formed man out of the dust of the earth. In Genesis creation story, we are told that, that God created man as the paragon of his creation. And after God created man, he made this pronouncement. He didn't say that, that man was okay. He didn't say that we were all right. He didn't say that, that we were good. Rather, this is the assessment that God made of the paragon of his creation, you. He looked at Adam and Eve and he said, you are very good. Now remember how carefully God gives out superlatives. So in saying that Adam and Eve were very good, what he means is that Adam and Eve were a perfect 10. And we are told nothing about how Adam and Eve look. If someone gave you a picture of Adam and Eve, held it up to you and says, who is this? You wouldn't know. The Bible is intentional about not describing Adam and Eve. It doesn't say that, that Eve had, had, had full lips. It doesn't say that she had blue eyes or long blonde hair. It doesn't say that Adam was muscular because how they looked did not determine whether or not they were very good. It's who made them that determined whether or not they were very good. Some of you missed it. When God made the assessment that Adam and Eve was very good, how they looked had nothing to do with it. What made Adam and Eve very good was the fact that God made them. And central, the same God that is responsible for shaping Adam and Eve and calling them very good is the same God that is responsible for shaping you. Therefore, you are very good. It's an insult to the God who created you to look in the mirror and be displeased with how he made you. It's an insult to the God who made you to look at yourself and wish that you were designed in some other way. You insult Insult God by not praising him because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139 invites us to celebrate the fact that God made us. And Psalm 139 invites us to celebrate how God made us. And Psalm 139 also invites us to celebrate the fact that God is always with us. Psalm, for the psalmist, God didn't create you, God didn't design you, God didn't give birth to you simply to leave you alone. Instead, the same God who, who shaped your origins is the same God who, who shapes your future. He says in verse 16 that all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And, and in the last part of verse 18, he says, when I awake, I am still with you. Same God who was intimately involved in your beginnings is the same God who is intimately involved in your endings. It would be inconceivable to God for him to abandon you. I, I, I read this story, happened a couple of weeks ago in Roseville, a, a suburb of Detroit. Some woman gave birth to a child because she was unable to, to care for him. She wrapped him up carefully and then placed him in a garbage can. She loved him enough to, to give birth to him. She cared about the child enough to, to wrap him in and make sure that nothing would happen to him as she placed him in the garbage can. But, but she didn't care enough about him to take care of him for the rest of his life. Aren't you glad, Central, that God is not like that. God gives birth to you. He creates you so that he can display his goodness in and through you by always being with you. The good news about the God that we worship 
is that God intends to always be with you through any circumstance. Tony Campolo tells this story. It's, it's absolutely one of my favorite stories to tell. He was in the second grade, just arrived in the second grade, and, and he wanted to declare his independence, so he asked his mother if he could begin to walk home by himself. When he was in the first grade, his mother had given some local neighborhood girl 25 cents every day to, to walk home with Tony Campolo and and now he said back to his mother, you pay this young lady 25 cents a day to, to walk home with me. Let me save you some money. All you got to do is give me a nickel and I can walk home by myself. His mother agreed to it. And for that whole year, Tony Campolo walked back home and nothing happened to him. At a party around Christmas time, he, he was bragging to all of his friends and family that I'm a big boy now. I walk home by myself. No one needs to walk home with me. I walk home by myself. I'm grown. He, he bragged so much about the fact that he was able to walk home by himself that, that his brothers and sisters, his sisters mainly, got tired of him bragging and, and then told him the truth. They said to Tony Campolo that, that you never really walked home by yourself. Every day, before school let out, mom would walk to your school and she would follow you all the way home. Why do you think that she never greeted you at the front door? She would go in the back and hide and keep the fact that you have never walked home by yourself from you. Central, you never have to walk home by yourself. God who created you is the same God who will walk with you. He is with you from your beginnings all the way to your end. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that we don't have to handle life's difficulties on our own, that we never have to walk home by ourselves. We thank you that you are intimately involved in every process of our lives from creation to our eternity, Lord God, and we praise you for that. Now, Father God, we, we give this time over to you. And by your spirit, we pray that you would work powerfully in the hearts and in the minds of your people, calling some into fellowship with you through your son Jesus or, or simply causing one to release some anxiety unto you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.